am I part of the Artemis generation? It, I, I'd like to think so, but the real people that I've been doing this for is those folks coming up. Want them to be proud of what we've accomplished, take it and run with it. Hello, Space Watchers, and welcome back to Space Cafe Radio. This is Emma, and today we're going to talk about Artemis 1. We're only three weeks away from the beginning of the first mission of the Artemis project, an ambitious US-led plan to return humanity to the moon. I fully admit that the idea that one day, not so distant from today, there might be people on the moon watching us on Earth gives me a sort of thrill chill. I completely missed the 60s buzz, and I was not even born when Apollo 11 landed. So the Artemis project feels to me a sort of this is my generation conquest for the series. I wasn't there when we first arrived, but I was there when we returned. The Artemis project, like all complex and long-term projects, is technologically difficult, and it's been riddled with political and economical challenges, such as delays, changes of political guidance, and last but not least, a very famous lawsuit by Jeff Bezos. So if on one side, Artemis could be considered the continuation of the Apollo mission, we cannot really think that everything's going to be the same. The political climate has changed, the world has changed, and the money involved have changed too. Like people say, you cannot swim twice in the same river. So what is at stake here? Why are we going back to the moon? Don't we have enough problems here on Earth? Which are the new boundaries we're going to break? What does it mean to go back to the moon in 2022? I wanted to talk about Artemis 1 and its long-term consequences with the people directly involved with the building of the most important parts of this first mission. What you're just about to listen is the first of a series of episodes to prepare us to the launch of Artemis 1. So please, buckle up, because we are just about to lift off. Start, two, one... And, and our first guest for the first episode is Jeremy Parsons. I'm the deputy manager for the Exploration Ground Systems Program here at Kennedy Space. Hi, Jeremy. Welcome to Space Cafe Radio. This is the Artemis special. Thank you for being with me today. How are you? Doing great. I'm doing great. We're, we're getting really close to launch. And so it's exciting to, to speak to you and the public about what we're getting ready to go do. In fact, my first question is, how is it going? How is the mood at Kennedy? You guys are so close. So the team is working really hard. This is the culmination of, you know, years and years of hard work. So there's a lot of excitement amongst the team, but we're also, we're pushing really hard to get to launch. And so, you know, some of those last final stages are, are really some of the most challenging in terms of big integrated test and and stuff like that. But I will tell you that the mood is really good. Is this your first mission on a lunar mission? It is my first lunar mission. So I I was fortunate enough to take part in space shuttle launches and the International Space Station program in the past. But I've been on this program for for a number of years. And um, I'll tell you, when I actually came to work for NASA in the first place, it was because I wanted to be part of a lunar mission. I actually switched my major to engineering. So I went to go see a shuttle launch and it just blew my socks off. And really what I said is this is going to be, you know, a career worthy of a life's work. And I wanted us to go back to the moon. And so it's pretty neat to be here today. Were you around in 69? <laughs> not quite, not quite. Uh, I, I, I wish, but but I have had the great opportunity to meet and speak with Mr. Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and then actually, um, wow. Gene Cernan, who was the last man on the moon. So I, I did have the opportunity to spend some time with them and, and converse with them. And I can't be more excited. About, I, was, I was pretty much fanboying when I spoke to them. I bet. That's mind-blowing. That's a space history in front of you. Uh, how is then Artemis different from Apollo? With Artemis, we're not just going to the moon. Right? Our ultimate destination is Mars. And so we're not just going back and and redoing some of the old steps. We're going to go to areas of the moon we've never done, we've never gone before. We're going to learn more about deep space living while we're there. But the ultimate goal is we're going to push further into space than ever before. Um, As part of our Artemis Accords, we're also bringing in international partners and international cooperation. And so this is going to be, you know, an endeavor of many countries 
taking us deep into space. And that's what's going to be required if we're going to you know, become a space or truly spacefaring nation going to other worlds. And how about the basic science? Is there still something to discover on the moon? It's a really cool question. In my mind, one, we're going to be doing different orbits, different areas of the moon uh, than we ever explored before. Back in Apollo, we, we landed in a relatively small area and really we're only exploring a relatively small area. So we're going to be able to go different areas than we ever have before. And really what we want to do is demonstrate new technologies and learn about kind of living deep in space. Um, so, right, it prepares us for Mars. What I mean by that is getting to Mars. You're going to talk six to nine months. Getting back is a similar sort of thing. You have to take everything with you that you might possibly need on the mission. You have to take your air, your food, your water. So what are we going to learn in the moon? Well, we're going to learn how to develop food, plant life. We're going to learn what can we do and what what we call in kind of the, the jargon is in situ resource utilization. Basically, how do I use the resources where I'm at to create tools, to create fuel, to create food sources, different things like that. And so that's really something I think uh, that we need our lunar exploration to help us get ready for so we can go deeper. Having a, a lunar base to then go to Mars, is it going to make the trip shorter, less expensive? What is uh... Both, uh, I think that they're still really working out some of those. And, and, you know, my current focus has been working on the launch and ensuring we have the launch capabilities required to meet everything up in orbit, that we can have the, the cadence we require. There, there's a number of different ways. I don't know if it will drastically reduce the time, but we are working on, on technologies for that, right? So certain engine development, solar electric propulsion, things like that can all really change that dynamic. But right now, one of the bigger things that we need is to create a heavy lift capability. And that's what SLS, or the Space Launch System, and Orion provides. It's a deep space space capsule, and it's a heavy lift capability. Right now, we're going to be able to take over 70 metric tons for our first launch um, of payload capacity. And so like when you put that in comparison to to any other vehicle we have in recent memory, the shuttle Mm -hmm. could put up 50 to 60,000 pounds. This is on a whole different scale. How much was the Saturn? Just out of you know, mind, I do you remember I don't, I don't remember it off the top of my head. Okay. But what we have is SLS is actually incrementally evolvable. So we already have a second stage that's being developed that'll bring us up to, you know, over 105 to 110 metric tons in a, in a single shot. Mm-hmm. And then eventually, you know, for the Mars sort of vehicle, we'll be up over 130 metric. This is going to be the most powerful rocket ever built. So as it compares to Saturn, it's kind of on, it's it's in that range, mm-hmm. but it is more powerful at lift flow. And then the ultimately evolved configuration will put up more mass than, than the For other. For the other Artemis mission. So I, I understand that there, there are many Artemis missions. There's Artemis 1 that is just about to leave, but then there is Artemis 2, Artemis 3. How many missions have been already approved and how many have been planned? They're planning out through 2030, a number of missions already. And Really, for the long-term exploration, we think further than that. So right now, kind of near term, we have an Artemis 1 mission that we're looking at the end of February launch. And that will be uncrewed. We're going to go orbit the moon, actually go further than any spacecraft has has ever gone before and bring it back. Artemis 2 will be our first crewed mission. And that will Mm -hmm. be, again, the lunar orbit, but we're going to have crew on there. And, and really test out those human systems. And then Artemis 3, we're looking at um, actually landing on the moon. And so that would be the first person of color and the first woman. From there, we start deploying all sorts of other assets. And so that will be, you know, we start to bring on Gateway. We start to bring on a, a number of different things that allow us to have that sustainable presence in deep space. And there's a lot of different ways that we're going about doing that. With the Artemis Accords, we already have, as of October, I think, of this year, we had 13 countries that were on board. And so they're really going to be working through who supplies what, uh, as, as far as what assets we're going to have up in orbit supplying this. And just like we did with the International Space Station. So the Europeans provided yeah. uh, you know, significant supply, the Columbus module, the MPLMs, or the multipurpose logistics modules. And so they're really working through 
what all of those agreements mean and who's providing what. You mentioned the gateway, which fascinates me a lot. This I can just see this harbor floating around the moon. Can you walk me through about A, what it is in very simple words, and B, how you guys are going to build it? Are you going to assemble it on Earth and then ship it up, or are you actually going to build it around the moon in orbit? Really, what it what it's going to allow us to do is have a staging point for missions to and from the lunar surface. And so it's going to be, I think, very similar to International Space Station in, in that regard. And then how we build it, uh, it will largely be assembled in, in so different different aspects. Right now, there's contracts for the logistics module, which will be ferrying to and from assets. But general plan is future missions, maybe Artemis 4, 5, and beyond. And I don't remember the, the exact because, again, it's still really being evolved. Orion will meet up with the gateway along with certain of the HLS or the human lander system components. Mm-hmm. And and that will be kind of the staging point for which they go conduct mm-hmm. those missions to the surface. Regarding the first three missions, Artemis 1, 2, and 3, what is the hardest part to build, the most technically challenging for you? So it's, it's a really good question. In, in my mind, I'm going to be really focused on probably the launch infrastructure more than anything. For us, the most challenging part is getting into this first flight, right? We're assembling a vehicle that is um, enormous in its scale. It stands over 320 feet tall. Um, it goes onto a mobile launcher, which essentially is a, is a rolling launch pad, right? And so then we're, we're bringing it out. So there's a lot that we're learning this first mission. And we expect it to, right? It's called learning curve in the sense that you go put something this complex together, you're going to find some stuff. And we're already getting better at the software systems, at integrated testing. And so I think getting to this first launch, it's going to be the biggest hurdle. And our team will just get better over time. As you get to Artemis 3, the human lander is going to be an incredibly complex asset to put into orbit. And, you know, the fuel they choose, um, what is the launch spacing between those missions to make it all occur? We're going to have to launch crews separately than the human lander, mate them up in orbit. So there is a lot of very, very technically challenging pieces we're still working on, which is how these missions execute. The day of the launch, what's the worst that could happen? What What's your nightmare? What keeps you awake at night, Jeremy? <laughs> Clearly, we we are going to go do something that's big, right? And it's technically challenging and it's dangerous. I think our team thoroughly understands where those risks are. We are putting in safety measures across the board. So I think what keeps me up at night is, have I not done everything I possibly can to make that team successful? How big is your team? There's a little over 2,000 people that are really working on uh, integrating all of this, putting all the systems together running the, the Kennedy Space Center sort of area in that sense. Our launch team, the day of launch, in the prime firing room has 100 people. And so those are the people that are okay. going to be really having the onus on their backs to, to help us get there. So in the next, um, let's say, 10 years, uh, looking at the next three or four Artemis mission, what could be, in your opinion, in your unfirmed opinion, the most breakthrough important discovery that you make on the moon, something that could be a game changer. I love the idea of figuring out how to use regolith on the moon and how to use those different things in order to, you know, or or helium-3, things like that, in order to make us a sustained space presence, right? Bringing everything we need with us is expensive. And so being able to use the resources that are on the moon to effectively either create fuel or, or habitats, all these different sorts of things, to me, becomes a game changer. Um, and it can lower the cost of going to and from and, and really allow us to have this kind of sustained presence. So NASA coined the expression Artemis generation to describe the importance of the moment. Do you feel that we are on the edge of a new era for space exploration for sure? but also maybe for humanity itself. I really like that one. It's amazing. I like it. They've they done a really good job. And, and so let me maybe tell you how I personally feel about it. I have two daughters, one's seven and one's nine. 
one of them, I can promise you, has all of the genetics to be an engineer, whether he wants it or not. And I want to leave them a program that can take us far into space. So what's funny is when she's at home, she's taken boxes and makes a spaceship. She's watched all sorts of documentaries on the space shuttle program. She knows exactly what we're doing in Artemis. And so to me, that's what that's about. Am I part of the Artemis generation? It, I, I'd like to think so, but the real people that I've been doing this for, is those folks coming up. want them to be proud mm -hmm. of what we've accomplished, take it and run with it. Sometimes I look at kids and I perceive for the first time that first time that their generation might be radically different from all the one before because of this, because how they will interact with space and the moon. And I love the idea that my daughters will be able to look up to the astronauts landing on the moon and see themselves. They'll say, can, I can do that, right? Fantastic. That to me is so cool. And, and so I'm really proud to share it with them. Last question. The day of the lunch, your eyes are going to be fixed on what? Well, I'm going to be trying to remember to breathe more than anything. But the, the day of lunch... I'm really just going to be trying to, to take it in. I'm going to make sure my family is, is out watching. And I will be, I think my current role right now is I'll be with the administrator, helping to guide him through the launch countdown process and communicate any issues that we have at the time. Jeremy, you've been great. Thanks a lot for being here with us. I love your enthusiasm. I can perceive the excitement that is in your words. Obviously, this has been 10 years of hard work for you, and this is the beginning of a dream. So I wish you all the best for uh, the day of the lunch. I really hope I will have the chance to talk to you again afterwards or in the future. And um, good luck with that. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure to speak with you. And I'll just leave you with Go Artemis. Thank you. Thanks a lot. This was the end of our first episode about Artemis 1. We will carry on with the countdown next week when we will talk about the SLS, apparently the biggest rocket ever built. So please tune in next week on Space Cafe Radio for Waiting for Artemis. And in the meantime, do not miss our Space Cafe podcast with Marcus and our original Space Cafe videos. You can find all these and much more on spacewatch.global. This is Emma. Until next time, ciao.